When we take a look at the NBA and its history, we remember all the great players, all the exciting players, but this leaves us with all the other players, and with all these other players, there are players that often go under the radar and we often forget about in debates. This is often because these players may have just not been as exciting to watch, or maybe they're just on a weaker team with a smaller franchise. Some players were even just overshadowed by their stars. In any case, I'm going to go over four of the most forgotten and underrated stars in NBA history. First off is Sidney Moncrief. The Los Angeles Lakers held the number one overall pick in the 1979 NBA draft and were heavily considering the high-flying versatile shooting guard, and nearly drafted him but ended up taking none other than Magic Johnson with the first pick. Sidney Moncrief then dropped to number 5 where the Milwaukee Bucks would pick him up. Sidney Moncrief was so polished coming out of the draft. There was no weakness to him and there never had been. He could drive, he could shoot, he could rebound, he could pass, and most of all, he could defend. Throughout his entire career, he won two Defensive Player of the Year awards and made five all-defensive teams. Even Michael Jordan quoted, When you play against Moncrief, you're in for a night of all-around basketball. He'll hound you everywhere you go, on both ends of the court. You just expect it. Coming from a player like Michael Jordan, that means a lot. He quickly improved to be a 20 plus point per game scorer and established himself as a perennial all-star, making it and the All-NBA teams five times. In his five all-star seasons, he averaged 21 points, 5.8 rebounds, 4.7 assists, 1.5 steals, 0.3 blocks, and shooting around 51% from the field. So what makes this guy so forgettable is that he played in the Bird Magic era. It's as simple as that, honestly. That era is so full of so many good players that him and his team were just overshadowed. In fact, the Milwaukee Bucks were third in wins in the 80s behind the Celtics and the Lakers. After getting knocked out in the conference semifinals every year, they finally made the conference finals but got knocked out by Dr. J and the most lone stacked 76ers team, 4-1 in 1983. The following year, the exact same thing happened, but they got knocked out by the Celtics this time in the conference finals. Just their team in general is so unrecognized, as even in Sidney Moncrief's rookie season, they got to the second round with six players, not including Moncrief, in double-digit scoring. Marcus Johnson, the first option in Moncrief's early career, who is another very underrated player, left the box inside 1984. Since they are both of our first options on the team, this left the team all the Sidney Moncrief, but with the departure of him and Bob Lanier came Terry Cummings and Craig Hodges. Paul Pressey also stepped up big time that season, but failed to get past the 76ers again in the second round. The Bucks would go on to participate in one more conference finals, but never make it to the finals. If this team could have just pulled through one year, they would have been much more recognized, but they were just one of those teams who always just barely came up short. Keep in mind he also spent four years in college, so he could have had a bigger impact in the NBA, but as an individual career, he was a Hall of Famer and will go down as one of the greatest shooting guards to ever play the game, even if people forget about him. He also holds one of the greatest nicknames ever, Sid the Squid. Next up is another man who's a victim of the 80s, Lafayette Lever. Also known as Fat Lever, this man was a walking triple-double. He would get them on the daily and even led the stacked 80s teams in assists, steals, and rebounds as a point guard. He was drafted to the Portland Trailblazers but never received enough minutes and was shipped to Denver after two years. In his six years in Denver, he averaged 17.1 points, 7.7 assists, 7.7 rebounds, 2.5 steals, and 0.3 blocks per game. Those are some ridiculous numbers and he even averaged 9.3 rebounds one season in Denver, making him so close to averaging a triple-double. And this is without stat padding too, <coughs> Russell Westbrook. <coughs> And just to think of it this way, he has more triple doubles than Rondo, Harden, and Michael Jordan, just to name a few. And to put up numbers like that on a team featuring Alex English, Dan Hassell, and Kiki Vandeweghe is quite incredible. As far as the playoffs went for the 80s Nuggets, they made it to the Western Conference Finals in 1985 but fell short to the Lakers. Lafayette Lever, Alex English, and these Nuggets teams were just a victim of the 80s, and one of the main reasons if Lafayette Lever isn't more recognized is because he played for a small franchise. The fact that he only ever made two All-Star games astonishes me, but in any case, he could still get 2020-10 games on a monthly, and was a star in my Denver Nuggets best years. At number 3 is another Milwaukee Bucks legend, Michael Redd. The more people I ask about Michael Redd, the more astonished I become that people don't know him. He was drafted 43rd in the crappy 2000 draft and proved to be a noteworthy steal. Although he only played in 6 games as a rookie and averaged only 2 points per game, he proved he could be a starter after Ray Allen left the team. Being a second round pick, it was hard for him, 
but he eventually came through and started putting up all-star numbers that were even better than Ray Allen's. By his fourth season, he was an all-star and an all-NBA player and was putting up over 20 points per game. By his seventh season, he was putting up 26.7 points, 3.7 rebounds, 2.3 assists, 1.2 steals, and 0.2 blocks per game, while shooting 47% from the field and over 38% from three. At this point in his career, he was making almost six threes a game and proved to be one of the best scoring guards in the NBA. He did get to the conference finals in 2001, where it was rigged for the 76ers to get to the finals, but other than that, he really never made it far, which is the main reason he's not more recognized. He did put up great stats in the 2006 playoffs, but as the 8th seed that year, they couldn't take down the Pistons. He was also a big part of Team USA's redeemed team in 2008, and was proving to be one of the hardest working players of all time. Sadly, his career came to a halt as he tore his ACL and MCL in his left knee in 2009. He came back for the start of the 2009-2010 season, but retore both ligaments in his knee again. After his second injury, he only ended up playing a season with the Phoenix Suns a year later, and then announced his retirement in 2013. Although his career was cut short due to injuries, he will remain one of the Milwaukee Bucks' greatest players to play and one of the NBA's most underrated players of all time. Drafted to the San Francisco Warriors in 1963, fourth overall, he had to fight for minutes behind bigs Tom Gola and Wilt Chamberlain. This team is already stacked as is, and the adding of another Hall of Famer like Nate Thurmond made it borderline impossible to stop. He played mainly power forward in his first two seasons until Wilt Chamberlain decided to take his talents to the 76ers, but with the departure of Wilt came the entrance of Rick Barry. With him, Thurmond, Guy Rogers, Paul Newman, and Al Adels, they proved to be solid making it to the finals multiple times but always falling short to the Boston Celtics, who dominated that era. If the 60s Celtics teams were never formed, the backbone of Thurmond and Rick Barry could have won multiple championships, and who knows, maybe Wilt would have never left in the first place. In the end, he racked up 7 all-star appearances and made the all-defensive team 5 times. In his best 5 seasons with the Warriors, he averaged 21.1 points, 19 rebounds, and 3.5 blocks per game. Those are some legendary numbers right there, especially considering the talent he was playing with. And this dude was a beast on the defensive end of the floor. Like, he, he could do it all. He was a smart defender and he could block shots. I would even go like as far as saying he was a better shot blocker than Wilt Chamberlain at the time and Bill Russell. Like, Bill Russell's obviously the smartest defender, but as far as shot blocking goes, like, him and Wilt were just neck and neck. And, you know, Wilt had the 50-inch vert or whatever, as people say, but... Uh, Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain exclaimed that he was the toughest guy to score on of their era, and th and this this is the 60s was the era of centers, so like, like it was it was tough to score for all the centers because there's so many good centers all split up into eight teams, but yeah, and and on the offensive end too, this guy this guy could do it all. He could finish the rim, um, he he, he could make his post hooks or whatever. Um, he could shoot the jump shot, he could do whatever. And he was the first player to ever record a quadruple double. After his 11 seasons with the Warriors franchise, he bounced around a few years before retiring with the Cavaliers. I talked about the 80s and the amount of underrated players in that era, but this era is debatably worse with the dominance of Bill Russell and Will Chamberlain. Even though this guy is in the Hall of Fame, I believe he deserves more recognition. Yo guys, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoy it, please leave a like, that would be sick. Uh, if you have any video ideas, let me know. It's always good. Like I've got tons, but like if you got any more under uh, more underrated players, that'd be sweet if you could give them to me. I've got so many more video ideas, but like the more the better. So thank you all for watching. If you made it this far into the video, probably not, but whatever. But I'll see you in the next one.